Isn't it about time for somebody's favorite radio program? This is America's Outdoor Talk program. Are you ready to get rowdy? Outdoors This Week with your host, Alex Langer. Alex Langer. We've got fishing. Believe me, folks, I have been there, and the fishing has been tremendous. Hiking. Adios. Have a nice trip. Camping. This is a real adventure. How do you know? When you're an experienced woodsman like me, you get a feel for these things. Oh, really? Heck, we've even got kayaking. I'm going to show you kids the time of your life. We've got all the info you need for a safe and fun day in the sun. It's a darn good thing we found you when we did. There's something horrible roaming these woods. And you've got Outdoors This Week. Outdoors This Week. And now, here's your host, Alex Langer. Why, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How did that man know that I was I was going to be on today? I, I kind of called him up and told him. All right. So, so <laughs> Sorry. We, it was you. It was me. It's it my bad. It was you. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks. Uh, we, we, we have a very, very special guest today with us. Uh, most notable fishing experts are stereotyped. They're stereotyped by species like bass, walleye, muskie, and even panfish. But we have somebody today that actually breaks the mold. He's a touring walleye fishing professional. He enjoys hooking crappie through the ice as much as walleyes in a raging river. And his acute ability to share this multi-species knowledge with others makes this guy an even more significant asset to the fishing world. Who am I talking about? It's none other than Tommy Scarless. Uh, Tommy is a native of Iowa, and his first fishing memory was ho- hooking a bluegill while fishing with his mother. You know, it's, it's kind of like, like mine is, too. And he continued honing his, his, his fishing seals on Clear Lake, Iowa. That's where Buddy Holly met his fate there. And, uh, and he fishes the Mississippi River, its backwaters, and small lakes, farm ponds, and expansive reservoirs throughout the Midwest. Now, let me tell you about his, his tournament fishing history. In 1996, Scarless joined in Fisherman's Professional Walleye Trail. He has since thundered through the circuits. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but he's, he's, won, he's won the prestigious PWT Angler of the Year title in 2004. He snatched 23, that's, that's 23 top 10 finishes, and he captured several big fish awards qualifying for the PWT Championship 13 straight times. Uh, Scarless earned the following nicknames: Mr. Erie. I'm not sure I would I would want that nickname. Uh, Mr. April by winning the first PWT event of both in 2001 in the Detroit River, and and in 2002 on Lake Erie. Uh, so, uh, and then we have all of our usual suspects. We have Ron Linder, who's going to be talking about God knows what. We should just have Tommy call it imitate Ron. Shouldn't we do that? And I then, think so. Then we have Larry Whiteley, who was your personal favorite. I'm not going to tell the other guys that. And then we have Sammy Lee and Wade Bourne. All, all of them, all of them have tremendous fishing reports for us. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Hang tight. More of America's Outdoor Talk program outdoors this week after this. Hi folks, Ron Linder here for Linder's Angling Edge Television. Seen it all over the country at uh, on Saturdays on WFN. That's a, a Canadian uh, channel. Also, we're on some Christian channels here and there, uh, peppered across the country, particularly on the Cornerstone Network. We're also, you can watch any of our shows on the web by going to Linder Media. You can see all our 2012 shows on lindermedia.com. Go to the web. They're immediately downloadable and available. Okay, what's happening in Minnesota? Ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. The nature fakers are at it. And why? One of the great, great causes of it. They always can get a lot of money for this. Wolves. They delisted the wolf. They put the wolf on the list that you can hunt them. Right now in the Twin Cities, you go through Minneapolis, St. Paul, big billboards, huge billboards, save the wolf, the da-da wolf, uh, don't torture wolves, the da-da-da, all this stuff. Also, articles popping up in a paper, my own paper right here, which I live up in 
in, in not a wilderness, but a, 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 a very rural area. And there was an uh, article in there. Let's not, you could tell that it came from a, a one of these organizations. Let us not ruin our ecotourism because if we have wolf hunting here, people won't want to come to Minnesota for ecotourism. Like I, and I'm trying to figure this out. Who in the world writes this stuff? If you had a million people come here on an ecotourism tour, I guarantee you not one of them would ever see a wolf in the wild. If they maybe had one staked out with a chain someplace and, and driven into the ground that they could use as a fake or, or, or maybe a, a silhouette of one, you might be able to see something. But you don't see these critters there yet there. I see them once in a while in an extremely remote area down a river over here in a, in a, uh, uh, and there's an army preserve where that, that, uh, it's called Fort Ripley, Camp Ripley. And it's a, it's a very wild area. Nobody goes there. And occasionally, especially lately, we've been seeing them in fall, in fall, when the deer are moving around, occasionally you'll see one or two. I saw two or three last year. And that's only in that one area. Most of the time, we don't see them. So ecotourism-wise, this is the biggest bunch of baloney in, in, in God's green world. Anyway, they're letting them hunt them. And, uh-oh, the baits with the use of dogs to hunt wolves, not in Minnesota, but in, in Wisconsin, which is next door over here. As Wisconsin prepares for its first wolf hunt season, hunting groups will say using dogs to track wolves are essential to success. But animal welfare ad- advocates say the state needs to do more to protect the dogs from the potential deadly confrontation with the wolves. That's probably got some truth to it. Eh? So, a Dane County judge, ta-da, ta-da, who they got a hold of, who fell for them, temporarily has banned the use of these dogs and will hold a hearing on Friday. This is where the nature fakers, they got these judges all in these places that up long time ago they said you could hunt the wolves there are, there are plenty of wolves there are and i mentioned this before in the state that i live in there's lots of them. and uh if i ever see a wolf in my backyard and, and it by the way it is not unlikely but if i do see one with my grandchildren believe me i'm dusting them i ain't calling the department of natural resources and he's getting buried oh, it's that fast they do this out on the farms out here out west uh there's a lot of cattle where they got the you know heifers little little doggies over there and and these wolves do it and and there ain't a lot of them so you know it isn't a big deal they're a hundred a year maybe that get get knocked down by a wolf but once a wolf gets on a farm or and he gets on the herd of cattle he will stay there and it's free lunch you know and they'll they'll stand them pretty good remember these babies can bring down a moose and they do uh a pack of wolves can bring down a, a, a moose this is why i think Protection is one thing. In my backyard, if there's anything, I don't want to pay a a zillion dollar fine because I'm protecting my own land. And the people in the cities, the nature fakers, don't understand this. They simply do not. Well, that's it for now from Ron Linder. See you later, folks. Pre-rut elk coming up on Bass Pro Shops Outdoor World. Would you like to spend less time on the couch and more time in the fresh air? Would you like your kids to stare at a bobber instead of the TV? Would you gladly trade in your microwave for a Dutch oven? Then you belong at Bass Pro Shops. Every week, we offer free skills workshops to help you get started. See the store or go to BassPro.com for more information. Bass Pro Shops. Your adventure starts here. When you're hunting elk before the rut in early September and there's hot weather, expect elk to move and feed for a couple of hours during the day if it cools off or after a rain. Hunt near food sources, travel lanes, watering sites, and bedding areas, elk seek relief from late summer and early fall heat on high open slopes, in low areas holding cool air, in shaded forest, or near water. Now look for elk on east-facing slopes and conifer trees with the bottom branches gone that allow cool winds to blow through and in shaded creek bottoms. Now because bulls are establishing dominance at this time, they may be willing to fight. Use the sounds and scent of a cow or try a bull challenging another bull. You can use the bugle to locate and attract the bull, 
Once the bull comes in, use cow calls, grunts, and glugging to convince him there's a young bull with a cow by using estrus and bull scent. Folks, the great outdoors, pass it on. I'm Larry Whiteley, and this is Bass Pro Shops Outdoor World. Why, thank you, Larry, for that wonderful report. And Lynn, Lynn is still holding a torch for you. I am. You are, Lynn. I am. D- despite the other Southern gentlemen, she still has a special place for Larry Whiteley in her in her heart. He's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell the other Southern gentlemen. No, don't do that. Listen, listen. I, I'm excited because we have a very special guest with us today. Most fishing experts are stereotyped by a species, like bass, you know, like Paul Elias, who we just talked to. He's a bass guy. He's a bass guy. And, you know, there's there's walleye guys, there's muskie guys, there's even even panfish guys. I bet you didn't didn't know that. No. They're they're panfish experts. But my next guest breaks the mold. He breaks the mold because he is a multi-species angler who has the ability to share his multi-species knowledge with others, and and that makes him even more significant to the fishing world. This guy's name is none other than, than Tommy Scarless. Uh, Tommy is a walleye pro, but he also fishes for every other species, and he is here with us now without any further ado, and, and also he does the best Ron Lindner the best uh, one ever. He, he does it better he, than Ron. He does it better than Ron. He I agree. Uh, Tommy, w- welcome to the show. Uh, uh, it even confuses me, <laughs> myself. How you doing, guys? <laughs> was was that Tommy or was that was that Ron? I don't that know. That was Tommy doing Ron. <laughs> Tommy, I got to be careful though, because I, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to get sued. If he lawyered up. You know, he's 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 pretty big boy. He could uh, he could get me in trouble. So that's right. You, no. you 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 don't want you don't want Ron Lindner lowering up. That that would be a bad scene. You, you, I don't I don't think it works. You you, you you you, you don't want to be in Ron Lindner's crosshairs. That that that's my understanding. I mean, I know I know it firsthand, but that that's what I that's what I get from from all of all of his friends and, and enemies. <laughs> and I don't think he has many enemies. The Linders are pretty well loved, but uh, it uh, it's always fun to imitate. Uh, you know, people, and it's some—it's kind of a little hobby of mine. And I do Al, and I do a couple other people in the industry. But do do, do Ron's, Ron's easy. Do do Al. Al. Yeah. Um. Huh. I think I, Tommy Scarless has probably imitated <laughs> Ron oh my four, God. five, ten, twelve, eighteen times. <laughs> <laughs> that is him. So so. Uh, I, I was going to call you Ron, Tommy, Tommy. W- what are you doing these days? Tell me about your life. Well, things are pretty awesome right now. You know, I fish so I can afford to hunt. And uh, right now I'm, I'm getting ready for fall fishing. I've got a couple of championships coming up with the uh, Masters Walleye Circuit Championship. I've got the FLW Walleye Tour Championship. I've got two walleye angler trail events on the Mississippi River here. It's pretty much all river. And uh, I just got done shooting a television show with Steve Panaz, Um about a week ago here, and it's called Lake Commandos. Steve, and I'm Steve. telling Steve, he's like, well, what's next? I'm like, well, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to go get my boat river ready. I'm going to get the Ranger River ready, the Triple R Theory. And uh, I've got all kinds of Mississippi River coming up, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. On top of that, Iowa youth season for deer starts next weekend, and Jake's ready to go after a buck. He got a doe last year. And... Um, you know, we're just, we're really having a lot of fun, enjoying the outdoors, living here in Northeast Iowa. Jake is your son, right? Jake is, yeah, I got two boys, an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, and Jake's the older of the two, and Nikki's got to wait till next year before he starts picking up the muzzleloader. Right, right. Tell me about your favorite lakes and techniques from, from the past season on the FLW Tour. Well, you know, it's really crazy. The learning curve... Uh, there's been a couple of pros that quit in the last 10 years, and they've said, well, the reason that I quit is the learning curve stopped. Um, and I I can't see it. I am so excited about uh, all the new stuff. That what, what, is, what do they mean by that? The, the well, le- that they quit learning. That they, that you know, it was just same old techniques, same old strategies. And, you know, a lot of the techniques that you see in fishing, um, we forget about. And and I'm sure we'll talk about that a lot in this in the show, but... You know, there, there's a lot of stuff that I learned 30 years ago that is brand new to other people. Right. There are things I've been learning that people have known for 30 years that are brand new to me. Right. And the learning curve for me keeps going, 
it actually exponentially keeps growing, Alex. And uh, I'm pretty fired up. You know, you'd asked me about some of my favorite moments, lakes, techniques. I won at Red Wing, Minnesota on the Mississippi River in the inaugural or the first FLW walleye tour event of the year. And in that one, I was pulling double Rapala minnows and double Salmo minnows, and I was also jigging with uh, the great big new power ripple shads from Berkeley. And what was exciting about that victory is that that the wing dam fishing that I'm doing is similar to some of the stuff I did growing up, but it's evolved now. And so it's on my home body of water where I grew up fishing with my old buddy named Cooter, that he taught me how to jig without a depth finder, without anything. And now I've got all this technology, and I win the event there on the river, and it was it was very exciting. Tommy, hold that thought. We're going to leave everybody on the edge of their chair. It's a, it's a little radio trick that I've perfected, and we'll come back right, right after the break. All right, Tommy? Beautiful. All right, we'll be back with Tommy Scarless right after this. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Don't change that dial. Alex will be right back with more of Outdoors This Week after these messages. Wow! Woo. Hold on to that, and that's a good one. Since Tight line with Sammy Lee. For the last few days, Stan Fagerstrom has been telling us how every fisherman can improve their casting accuracy. Hello, this is Sammy Lee. In just a moment, I'll conclude my visit with Stan by hearing how you can be proficient with spinning tackle. But first, this message. You enjoy your time on the water, but you probably don't think too much about why you enjoy it so. Maybe that's because you get there safely using a boat trailer equipped by unique functional products. UFP manufactures the axles, brake lines, and braking systems used on America's best recreation vehicle trailers unique functional products goes in before their name goes on so enjoy your trip and remember at ufp your family's safety means as much to us as it does to you unique functional products from people dedicated to making things happen over the last several days casting expert stan fagerstrom has been sharing some of his tips on how to become more proficient with our casting and during this time stan has spent a great amount of time discussing the use of spin casting and bait casting rods and reels but how about spinning equipment? Can a person learn to be accurate with these? You do much the same thing that you do with a level one reel. What I do when I line up on a target to achieve accuracy, now certainly you're going to depart from some of these procedures as you gain experience, but in the beginning, it's just like playing a round of golf. You have to learn how to hold the club and everything else. Same thing is true of, of practicing your fishing. I face my target, I take a nice relaxed stance so I feel comfortable. And Sammy, I get my rod and reel out in front of my body, and I don't care whether it's a bait casting outfit or a spinning outfit. I get it out in front of my body. I rotate my wrist to the left just a bit so my knuckles are up, reel handles up, because that unlocks the wrist joint. Now I draw an imaginary line from my nose to the target. And I make when I cast, I make my rod walk right up and down that line. No way possible I'm going to be off left or right. You won't be either. But what does a beginner do? You watch. The rod comes clear back over his shoulder or something. Lost their aiming point. Lord knows where that plug's going to land. Now that they'll keep the outfit out in front of their body, draw that imaginary line from the nose to the target, bingo, they're going to be right in line with that thing. No matter what type of rod and reel they're using. That's right. It'll, it'll be slight differences between all three of them, but, but those differences are minor. Well, having watched and learned from Stan Fagerstrom for a number of years, I can attest to what this man says and does. I hope that some of Stan Fagerstrom's casting tips help you become a better angler. I'm Sammy Lee, and until next time, Tight Lines. Tight Lines, brought to you by Spectraburst, the ultimate color-changing technology. Huntmate, the best hunting app for your iPhone. By UFP, America's leading maker of brake systems for boat trailers. And by Bleeding Bellies Lures, the bait that actually changes color. Thanks, thanks, Sammy Lee. And I, I think I, I actually learned something from that report, Lynn. That's cool. I, Draw a line from your nose to, to where you're gonna, where you want to yeah, cast. That's really cool. I never thought about that. I didn't either. How about that, Tommy? Tommy Scarless is on the line with us, and Tommy is a is a multi species angler. He's not stereotyped like everybody else is. He's not just a bass, a walleye, or or musky guy, or, or even panfish guy. Tommy Scarless breaks the mold. 
He's a touring walleye pro who enjoys hooking crappies through the ice as much as walleyes in the Raging River. This acute ability to share his multi-species knowledge with others makes Scarlet's even more significant to the fishing world. And he's our guest today. Aren't you lucky? Tommy, welcome. Thanks for having me, Alex. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for saying yes to us. We were talking about the technology in fishing now. How does that compare to, to what you call simple fishing? Well, you know, fishing has gotten pretty technological, and there's been some great new advancements in fishing. The ones that I've been using a lot lately and have found awfully, you know, interesting would be AquaView. You know, they've been making underwater cameras for years. They've got a new handheld camera right now called the micro that's the size of a smartphone really so instead of now getting out the boat anchor which the older cameras were big and cumbersome right and you'd have to stop the whole process this thing you can pull out of your pocket it's got a lens on it or a camera the size of an acorn and boom you can drop it right down in the water and start looking around with the micro is it as good so as we, the is the original aquaview it's it's the original aquaview company it's actually changed hands. There's a new owner that, uh, a couple of new owners that are up in Minnesota yet, the land of fishing. Right. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's a lot smaller than the old ones. The old ones used to fit the size of a small briefcase. I remember those. I mean, they, they worked fine, but the, the, the cumbersome nature of them was, was definitely a hindrance. It was like an anchor. You know, so now with this new micro, if you want to know what's down there. Right. Um, we've even had an instance where a buddy of ours dropped a pair of sunglasses, his prescription sunglasses, down an ice hole. So we drilled a hole right next to it, dropped the camera down the hole next to it, and then in turn we were able to see the, the sunglasses. And so then we dropped a, a lure down the, the hole he originally dropped them down in, snagged the glasses, and reeled them back up to the top of the surface and got them back with a camera. So, I mean, it's got all kinds of uses. Wow. And we called it an anchor. Well, you know, getting out the boat anchor is also seems to be a chore. You got to have a good back. You got to put it in the water. You got to pull it out. You got to wash it off. Well, now with Minn Kota, they've actually got a on a Tarova or any other autopilot trolling motor system. They've actually got uh, the new Minn Kota system where they've got an anchor feature on their autopilot motors. So you can actually run up onto a spot, hit that anchor button and in turn that motor will keep you right on that gps coordinate while you fish a spot wow so no longer do you have to worry about playing a fish and drifting off the school or you know getting out of the way and it what it's what it's called is it's Minn Kota's iPilot feature yeah it's actually an add-on that you can add on to your existing Minn Kota trolvas and other trolling motors and it's just a phenomenal feature to get out the boat anchor it, it, without getting out the boat anchor is it a software feature tommy Yes, it's actually it's a it's an additional add on. I think retail it's like three nine nine, a little bit over four hundred dollars. But um, trolling motors nowadays are up over, you know, a thousand dollars for a trolling motor. But the price of an anchor, the ability to fish things the way you want to fish them, it's got three tracks that you can run. So I can store three trolling passes on this trolling motor, and go back and without having to run the motor, I can let the boat do the trolling for me. Wow. And, you know, I mean... That's kind of whiz-bang stuff that we only dreamed about back 20, 30 years ago. Well, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's grown. Technology has made fishing go a lot faster than most of us might have wanted to, but it's also helped us. I mean, one of the biggest keys to my success over the last 10 years has been Navionics cartography. Right. And where you actually have a, uh, you know, a, a map on your electronic unit through a chip that you've purchased through Navionics, and what everybody always used to get hung up with is they'd have to wait till the next map came out. Yeah. I'm waiting till the next map comes out. And now Navionics has freshest data to where you can go to their website and download the new mapping data that's free of charge within one year purchase of a Navionics chip. So no more waiting for the technology. You can get it on a weekly basis, so, and it's free when you do that. So how, how often do they update the, the information? There's updates going on there daily. Really? So pretty simple. You plug in your chip. You look at uh, the Navionics website, and it says, okay, there are updates available for your chip, and then you download them, and boom, you're back out fishing. Now, we talked about fishing being technologically advanced, but you also mentioned something about simple fishing. Right. What are your views on simple fishing? Well, you know, my views on simple fishing is sometimes we have to be careful about um, getting too technologically advanced. Yeah. And... 
that was great to where you said you had learned something with uh, Stan and Sammy Lee talking there yeah. on tight lines. And you know what? They, he had it. That's, that's a point that I forgot on how to cast. Now casting come na- comes naturally right. for you, me you, and for you. You, you don't think about it anymore. But, you know, if I were to think about it, that's a great piece of advice. I think he did it a lot better than I could do it, teaching somebody how to cast, because <laughs> I forgot how I cast. I just cast. But That's right. You don't even think about it anymore. <laughs> no. You know, and the, the biggest thing is people get hung up on technology. It's great that I've got my AquaView camera. It's great that I've got my iPilot on my Code, and it's great that I've got Navionics Fresh Data. But sometimes we get hung up on technology, and we don't put a line in the water. So we're playing with our whiz-bangs and our gizmos. And my, my sentiment that I've been expressing is, just get out on the water and get a line in the water. And I'll take it a step further. My wife will not fish with me because it's too technologically advanced. Wow. Uh, so with the two boys that are six and eight, my wife and myself, and us trying to find more family and better family things to do on the weekend other than bitty basketball and other stuff that I don't think the kids have been enjoying lately. Tommy, we got to take a break, but w- would you come back for another segment? I really want to. All right. I want to talk about the Nightcrawler. All right. We'll talk about the Nightcrawler when, when we get back, and we'll be right back with Tommy Scarless. Don't go away. of America's favorite outdoor talk program, Outdoors This Week, after these messages. When deer season comes in, the more hunting pressure deer is subjected to, the less visible they become. This was the main finding of a recent study in Oklahoma, conducted by Dr. Steve Damaris at Mississippi State University. He learned that when hunters show up, the bucks especially head into dense cover. I'm Wade Bourne, and this is Wired to Hunt Radio. In a minute, Dr. Damaris sheds light on the perennial question, where did all the deer go? Stay with us. Wade will be right back. Hey, hunters, I've been using a product that you need to see. A gun rests so small you keep it in a pocket until needed. When getting ready to shoot, hook it to a tree limb or whatever is available. Why carry a stick? I like this compact concept so much I put a video of it on my website, wadebornoutdoors.com, for you to watch. See for yourself why Little Sure Shot has become the number one selling compact gun rest worldwide. That's wadebornoutdoors.com or Google Little Sure Shot Gun Rest. Cabela's is the world's foremost outfitter for hunting, fishing, camping, and outdoor gear. They offer more gear than anybody, best selection, prices, and quality, all backed by Cabela's legendary guarantee. Shopping with Cabela's has never been easier or more convenient. You can outfit all your needs through Cabela's catalogs, website, and their many stores. Check them out at cabelas.com. Cabela's, the world's foremost outfitter. This is Wired to Hunt Radio. Dr. Steve Damaris' research study in Oklahoma involved putting GPS collars on several deer and then tracking their movements when the hunting season opened. They did so on three 1,500-acre tracts. One tract had no hunting pressure, one had very light pressure, and one had relatively heavy hunting pressure. Here's what he learned. We found that uh, the bucks at that higher hunter density significantly altered their movement patterns associated with the hunting season. And they become much more invisible uh, on the higher uh, density and with time after the beginning of the season. So it's really interesting and exciting. I asked Dr. Damaris, what's the practical application in this for deer hunters wherever they hunt? The hunter density is critical. If you have too many hunters on a property, you will make the deer become invisible. Keep your hunter density low. And also, when uh, they also started changing the habitat that they utilize in response to the hunters. They became much more effective at using uh, denser habitat. So they shifted from more open habitat to heavier, denser habitat. And so that helped them become invisible. Tomorrow, Dr. Steve Damaris returns with more interesting facts from this deer study he conducted in Oklahoma. And that's today's Wired to Hunt Radio. I'm Wade Bourne saying thanks for listening. 
Get outside. Thanks, Wade. And I, I always learn things about fishing from listening to, to Wade Bourne's hunting tips. So uh, we, we have with us Tommy Scarless. Tommy is a notable fishing expert who breaks the mold. He's not typecast in bass or walleye or muskie or even panfish. He breaks the mold. He teaches everybody everything there is to know about fishing. Did I get that right, Tommy? Well, I try to. I try to teach everybody everything there is to know. I, I, think, it's, I, I think I know it all. I think you do know it all. <laughs> That's why we keep having you back. I, we haven't figured out that you don't know it all. <laughs> well, you know, I, I tell you, you know, and fishing is a lot of times what you know, and sometimes fishing is just what the fish knows and, and trying just to feed a fish. And right. It's pretty basic. Right, right. Before we went to the break, you, you want to talk about the night crawler. What is the night crawler? Well, you know, worms, night crawlers, whatever you want to call them. Um, it's ironic that a lot of times these worms get shipped down here from Canada, right? And then we buy the night crawlers and we go fishing with them. And if right. we go back up to Canada, we have to take them out of the dirt they came in, and we have to put them in bedding because it's illegal to take dirt now across the border. I didn't know that. It, why? Why is it illegal to take dirt? Well, with invasives and junk like that, they're worried about contaminants coming back through in the soil and the bedding. Yeah. actually eliminates a lot of those opportunities. So for, I, I, I remember like 30, 40 years ago, we, we used to use Weber bedding. Do we still use that today? Um, I don't know if that's still available. I know that um, there's bus bedding. There's also uh, some stuff from uh, Fraybill that they've got out right now. I can't remember the name, but it's it uh, it feeds the crawlers. And uh, it's, you know, bedding nowadays for night crawlers has food in it. Right. And uh, I keep telling them, hey, man, you got to come up with a bedding that's got power bait or gulp scent in it because then you can scent your crawlers. But, you know, the, the night crawler is a pretty basic tool to use. And I'm catching a ton of walleyes, bass, bluegills on just a half a night crawler or a piece of night crawler. And the biggest key is to back up the night crawler. And what I mean by that is if I'm jigging, I've got on a night crawler for scent, I'm also going to use some type of scented plastic or artificial like power bait or gulp in order to give myself what I call double confidence and double power. Live bait doesn't have enough scent? Um, you know, what I like to do is I like to use it for both confidence, yeah. and I like to give them both a couple of options. You know, the night crawler might get picked off, and that's the disadvantage of using live bait, is that it's easily pulled off the hook by a fish. Right. But if you've got a power bait, say a power bait ripple shad or grub on there, or if you've got a gulp alive minnow, they may pull off your minnow, but they've still got that artificial scented shape still on the hook, and therefore, you know, your success rate climbs. And what it's going to do is artificials catch a lot of fish. In fact, the bass circuits, unlike the walleye circuits, are all artificial. Right. And you can't use live bait. So what it does is it gives your average angler the confidence that's always fish live bait to switch and make that switch by all of a sudden realizing, hey, you know, that fish picked off my night crawler, but I still had gulp on there, and he ate it. Right, right. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's hard to fool Mother Nature, and uh, it's hard to fool fish, Alex, and it's hard to beat a swimming minnow or a wriggling crawler sometimes. I think also in bass fishing that the scent is not as quite important as color, action, and motion. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I agree entirely. I mean, you've done a whole study on it. Your career is uh, founded on scientific fact of what fish want to eat right. with a lot of the lures that you've developed. Yeah. And, you know, you go into this with, with bass fishing, it is a lot of sight-oriented to where you get into catfishing and walleye fishing, and uh, then you've got, a, you've got a lot of flavor or scent, um, actually, them using different olfactory senses other than just the catfishing is almost all scent then you got walleye and and then you got bass on the other end where scent is almost not a factor correct and you know what kind of a neat pair, uh, uh segue on this or a neat way to to go from one subject to the other that I, I wanted to talk about getting back to the basics you know we've got a lot of super lines and they work great in bass fishing they work tremendous in walleye fish uh lines like fire line and power uh you know, some, some of the different spider wire stealth and some of those different super lines that they've got out nowadays. I use a lot for vertical jigging. I use a lot in situations where I need more sensitivity or more feel. But good old monofilament line. I think it's time for a lot of anglers to get back to the basics. I, I grew up fishing with Trilene XL and Trilene XT from Berkeley. Right. They're still the same, pretty much the same formulas out on the market right now. But they're monofilament, and that stretch 
and that limberness, uh, you know, that limpness of that monofilament will actually help you catch more fish. So I think it's time. I've gone back and I'm fishing a lot more of the good old trilenes, and I'm catching a lot more fish because of it, because it stretches, and because it doesn't pull the hooks free as much as other some of the other lines out there today. Uh, t- Tommy, we got to wrap up the show. Unfortunately, we could talk for for another couple of hours. I know we could. Uh, where can people get a hold of you if they if they want to do that? If they want to find me, we've got a new thing out, me and a couple of other gentlemen called Wild, the number four outdoors, Wild Four Outdoors. It's both on Facebook, or you can find it at wildfouroutdoors.com, and uh, it's a bunch of fun stuff to do in the outdoors with both your family, your buddies, or by yourself, and uh, it's a great way to be wild for outdoors. Okay, Tommy Scarless, thank you again for, for being with us, and we're going to have to do this again for a lot longer, okay? Absolutely. You and Lynn are the best. All right. Thanks, Tommy. You, you and your buddy, Ron Lynn, you're the best. <laughs> Garland doesn't even hold a candle to me. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Tommy. And folks, thanks for joining us for another Outdoors This Week. Bye-bye. Alex Langer, Outdoors This Week.